Astronomy Cast, episode 255 from Monday, March 5th, 2012, Observing Hydrogen. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hi, Pamela. How are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing really well, uh, having fun recording another episode of Astronomy Cast with all of our closest friends here on Google Plus. So, if you want to watch us live record the show, um, which we know not many people can actually do because they have jobs and lives and things like that, but uh, but yeah, you can just go to cosmoquest.org/hangouts and you'll see a see a list of all of the shows that we do. We do a ton of astronomy yeah. related content and science with with us and Phil Plate and Emily Lakdawalla from Planetary Society and and uh, Alan Boyle from MSNBC. So we got lots of the space friends and we're doing lots of really good content and you should come and check it out. And that's it. Yes. Cosmoquest.org slash hangouts. And we also, the, you, the, we embed the shows there so you can watch them live. You can participate in the conversations. And then of course, uh, if you can't watch it live, we do try and mix everything and, and feed it into the Astronomy Cast feed. And actually, I, I realized... We've been putting the weekly space hangout into the astronomy cast feed and didn't warn anybody. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so you if you've noticed, got new content. Yeah. So if you've noticed now that you're getting like an extra hour of uh, audio content every week, that's this weekly space hangout that we're doing on Google Plus. So no one's complained. <laughs> no one has also said, hey, thanks for putting that in there. I really appreciate that. So I don't know whether people are deleting them or what, but if you're getting those and you're happy, that's great. If you're getting them and you're sad, then also let me know because we could also just break it up. But I think, yeah. you know, it's pretty interesting. It's the kind of content that we people always ask us to do, but we never did. Right. We just talk about the news and the current events and analysis of, of that kind of stuff, which is totally different from Astronomy Cast. So anyway, yeah. uh, that's all in there. Sorry about that. I uh, hope you're okay with that. Please <laughs> let us know if you're not. Um, all right. Well, why don't we uh, get cracking then? Um, so hydrogen is the most common element in the universe, formed at the beginning of everything in the Big Bang. It's the ra raw material of stars gathering together through mutual gravity into vast nebulae. Astronomers can learn so much looking for hydrogen in the universe. Well, here's why and how they do it. Now, we wanted to sort of, I, when we first sort of set up the show, I was like, okay, so the topic is hydrogen. And you're like, no, 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 that's too big. That's too yes. much. Let's just observe it, it's hydrogen. It's like 70% of the universe. There's a whole lot of stuff going on. And let's, yeah, and let's the chemistry and fusion and, yeah, and powering yeah. cars and things like that. So, <laughs> um, but, but at least I think we should just have a, a brief conversation just about the formation of, of hydrogen and where it all came from. And then I promise we won't go into the detailed chemistry of it. Well, it, so, so hydrogen, talking about its formation is, is somewhat silly. You, you take energy, you leave it on the shelf, it becomes protons probably uh, or other particles. And if, if it's enough energy to become a proton, well, one pr proton, that counts as ionized hydrogen. Uh, let it near a neutron, you now have a, a slightly more interesting hydrogen atom. Give it an electron, you now have a neutral hydrogen atom. So basically hydrogen is that stuff that just formed when the universe's energy um, cooled off enough to start forming particles. Everything more complicated than hydrogen, you have to have some sort of a, a nuclear fusion reaction take place in order to get to it. So. Hydrogen's just that simple thing that comes out of energy. And so, you know, back when the, during the Big Bang, when everything was just too hot, you just yeah. had raw energy. Yes. And then as things cooled down, that raw energy turned into protons. Mm -hmm. and protons, neutrons, electrons. Neutrons and electrons, and, and you just, you know, you just gather them together in the simplest possible way. And that's hydrogen. Now, obviously, we yeah. talked about it in a few of these episodes that you had this moment where the entire universe was like the state of a of a star, and they were the hydrogen atoms were being fused into helium, and that's where we get the helium from. But really, and then the expansion continued, and now we're just yeah. left with all this hydrogen. It's just this raw material, the building block of the entire the entire universe. So, so then. How, so, and then why is it, I guess, important then for astronomers to be able to observe hydrogen? Well, it's, it's not so much that it's important to be able to observe hydrogen so much as we can't help but observe hydrogen. Uh, 
It, it's out there and it's causing us a whole variety of good things and bad things. So, so on one hand, every time we're looking at a star, we're observing a excited hydrogen atmosphere. Every time we look at a beautiful nebula, we're observing a cloud that's rich in hydrogen gas that's usually glowing red. When we start trying to look through the galaxy in radio light, uh, we find all of, of the cold parts of space permeated uh, with what's called the 21 centimeter line of hydrogen. It's just everywhere. Even when we look at high redshift galaxies, we find in the spectra of these galaxies, all these places where intervening hydrogen gas has sucked the light out of the spectra of these distant galaxies. So. If you study astronomy, you're just going to over and over come across the vocabulary of hydrogen, and it can get a bit overwhelming. That was actually part of the inspiration for the show, is we've been doing live star parties, and I realized last night we're talking about H-alpha, H2, uh, all of these different terms, and no one knows what the heck we're talking about. Right, and so hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, so you just can't help but see it everywhere you look. Yes. Um, and so we might as well understand what it is that, that you're looking at. So is, is it almost like all astronomers are pretty much hydrogen astronomers, you know, like a certain well, point yeah. of time is, is just dealing with the hydrogen in everything they're looking at? Yes, and, and one of the hazing rituals of getting a physics degree is learning all of the quantum mechanics of, of the hydrogen atom. And, and so by the time you finish getting uh, even an undergraduate degree, you are uh, intimately aware of the inner workings of hydrogen at levels you may not want, and you know how to find it all over the universe. But you're going to spare us the quantum mechanics today, I'm right? I'm going to spare you the quantum mechanics today. Okay, good, good. <laughs> All right, so then, um, so then let's talk about the different flavors of hydrogen that astronomers will observe out in the universe. Well, the, the most common way that, that we confront hydrogen just as we peer through the sky with a pair of binoculars or with a telescope is, is what's called hydrogen bomber lines. Um, so when you look out, you'll see particularly what's called uh, either hydrogen bomba alpha line or just hydrogen alpha because we get lazy. This is that bright red color that is associated with most nebula and it comes from the fact that the hydrogen's energy levels are such that that one lone electron it's got, it can jump between, well, its lowest energy level to its second energy level and transitions in and out of that lowest energy level. Those occur in the ultraviolet where we don't see them with our eyes. So those are probably the most common transitions, but the ones we don't see because ultraviolet gets blocked by our atmosphere. Now go up one set of energy levels and look at the transitions in and out of the second energy level. Well, there we have what's called the three to two from the third energy level to the second energy level transition. And that's at this beautiful red color that we see in open signs at the local deli and we see in all of these nebula that are, are all through the sky. So that red color associated with nebulosity, that is the uh, lowest transition in and out of the second energy level of hydrogen. And this transition was discovered by a dude named Bomber, so it's called the Bomber energy set, and alpha is for the lowest one. So three to two is, is alpha, and then if you went four to two, that would be beta, and so on through the list. And just, just to be clear, I mean, I think we talked about this in, in previous shows as well, right? This is this transition, this energy transition, right? When, a, yeah. when an atom of hydrogen, where it's got its proton, it's got its neutron, and then it's got this electron, and that electron jumps up or down a level, you, you can get like a release of energy and, and we're right. seeing the photons streaming away from these nebula as these, these electrons are being released. So, so to get this to happen, you have to have a cloud of gas that's getting heated up by something. So there's either a bright star embedded in the cloud, there's a whole bunch of bright stars embedded in the cloud, and the light from these stars is exciting the hydrogen uh, so that it, it's making this, this transition. No, sorry, um, when you say, sorry, just, I'm going to be kind of precise here, just, okay. when you say exciting, so you mean like, like photons are streaming mm -hmm. off of this star. Those photons are getting absorbed They're by the hydrogen atom. Right. 
and the hydrogen atom in response to absorbing this photon, the electron is jumping to a higher energy level. And it might actually jump a whole bunch of energy levels depending on what right. energy it gets hit with. And this actually has the neat effect where if the geometry is such that you look out, you look at the cloud, and the star that you're looking at is on the other side of the cloud, when you look at the cloud, you'll actually see the hydrogen alpha light, that red light, removed from the colors that you're looking at. Now, if instead the star is off to the side and not precisely lined up, then you see that color, that, that red energy from the star is getting absorbed by the hydrogen, re-radiated in all directions, and so you end up seeing the nebula as red. Right, but the point is, and this is sort of where this whole concept of quantum comes from, right, that, that there is this very discrete, very specific step that these, yeah. these electrons take as they jump up the energy levels, and with it there's a corresponding release that comes out in a very specific color, and it's that color of radiation that we see with our telescopes and that, uh, that astronomers are really specifically looking for. They're, they're actually they're limiting the entire spectrum that they could see yes. down to that exact specific light. And, and this is actually something that, that anyone out there listening can experience for themselves. A lot of gag stores, a, a lot of novelty stores will sell these prism glasses that create rainbows when you look through them. Well, if you get one of these pairs of rainbow glasses and you walk up to your local deli, you walk up to your local pub, whatever, and you look through these glasses at the neon signs, you'll see the discrete specific lines given off by the atoms in that sign. So if you look at a red open sign, you're going to see this bright red line that comes from the hydrogen alpha. But you'll also see this gap and then this bright, they call it cyan, it, to me I'd call it turquoise, this bright turquoise line, and that's hydrogen beta. Then a little bit over to the side from that is a hydrogen gamma. This is the 5 to 2 transition, and this is like Crayola blue or uh, that 0, 0, uh, sorry, 0, 0, 0255 if you work in, in RGB colors. And so you'll then start seeing closer and closer spaced uh, deeper shades of blue as you look at the spectra of that red open sign. And then you'll see a completely different set of fingerprints if you look at a green right. sign or a purple sign, but that red open sign has this distinctive spectra through the novelty rainbow glasses um, that, that's the hydrogen bomber series. Right, and so I guess what astronomers are doing, right, is they're filtering out every color of light except yeah. for that specific sort of in the frequency range that they're trying to see. The equivalent of putting use, those if crazy we use glasses a on. Alpha filter. Yeah. Right. And so that's the point, right? And so astronomers will have a collection of these filters. They'll have one just for hydrogen alpha. How many how many sort of hydrogen related filters will, will an astronomers use? Um, so I, at a certain point, you, you stop using filters and you use color that's usually so blue we can't see it. It gets moved a little bit redder, a little bit redder, a little bit redder until we can see it. And they'll create filters tuned to see the Lyman alpha um, of galaxies that are moving at specific velocities. And I guess this is part of the thing that the, that the amount of that it, frequency is so tight that if it is redshifted, you've got to yeah. push it further up and down the, the frequency. Okay, so, so astronomers have, you know, know that they want to see this specific kind of frequency of, of light, and they've got the tools to be able to, to see it, but what does seeing it tell them? Why do they want to do this? Um, well, it's, it depends on what you're doing. Um, so Trying to do science. <laughs> Well, and, and so the thing is, there's, there's lots of different science that you can be doing. So, uh, for instance, when we look at, uh, when, when we're looking at different nebula locally, we're, we're often trying to figure out what is the distribution of um, temperature in a cloud of gas, what is the density of the gas, and so when we're, we're looking at uh, the hydrogen alpha light, when we're looking at the light and all of these different uh, energy levels of, of hydrogen, what we're trying to do is figure out just how hot is that gas. And this is where we start talking about things like H2 regions. Mm -hmm. So a, an H2 region, uh, the, the crazy no notation we use in astronomy is 
a letter from the periodic table is, is clearly the abbreviation for the atom. If it has a Roman numeral 1 next to it, that's something that hasn't been ionized at all. It's completely neutral. Um, if it has a 2 next to it, that means we've yanked off one electron. If it has a 3 next to it, we've yanked off two electrons. So take the number, subtract 1, and that's how many electrons we've removed from the atom. So when we talk about an H2 region, we're talking about a region of space filled with hydrogen gas, and that gas is ionized one time to remove that one electron. Now, in, in these H2 regions, this is a cloud of gas that is typically being heated up by really hot, bright stars. Um, so when you look at the Orion Nebula with, with all of its O giant stars embedded in the gas, um, you're looking at an H2 region. And in these regions, the hydrogen atoms will periodically glom on to one of these free electrons. And as they glom on to the free electron, the electron will cascade down through the different energy levels. And it will give off hydrogen alpha. It will give off hydrogen beta. And it will give off all these different parts of the, the spectrum. And, and by looking at that and looking at the ratios of, of how many of the atoms appear in the different energy levels, we can start to get at the uh, density of the material and the temperature of the material. Now, you mentioned a couple of other things as well, and there's also like neutral hydrogen and cold yeah. hydrogen, and those are useful for astronomers to observe as well, right? Right. So, so another one of the things that we look at is what's called the 21 centimeter line. Of, of hydrogen. And this is perhaps one of the harder things to try and explain. It, it's actually something that um, when we teach it, it, we talk about this is something that was originally referred to as uh, not going to happen, never going to be observable. And it's because it's a process that takes a long, long time for it to happen. So if you take a hydrogen atom, um, its proton in the center has what we call in quantum mechanics a spin, and the spin is either spin up or spin down. Then its orbiting electron has the same thing. It either has a spin up or a spin down. And ideally, the, the two little bits, they want to be lined up the same. And, and so what you'll have is if you leave hydrogen alone long enough and it's not in its lowest possible energy, you'll end up getting that spin flip. And the energy given off in this flip is, is energy that corresponds to light with a wavelength that's 21 centimeters long. Now, the, the probability in most cases is that before the, the atom has a chance for that flip to take place, because it takes a long time for the atom to finally get around to flipping, probabilistically. Um, it's probably going to undergo a collision. It's probably going to undergo an excitation. Something's going to happen to it. The only way that you're going to consistently get this spin flip is if you have a whole bunch of gas. It's really cold and thus not moving. So all the little atoms are just sort of going not moving, moving very slowly. And it's very um, diffuse gas as well. So you need cold diffuse gas. Well, it turns well, it's kind out of interesting, though, right? Because there's a way, like you wouldn't think, like if it's out there just super cold in space, just yeah. sitting there, not interacting, yeah. you would think there'd be nowhere to see it. It would just be invisible. But because there's this crazy quantum effect, that these, yeah. they, they just randomly spin flip, flip yep. you get a release of radiation that's very subtle, but it's there and lets you detect it. And, and so this, this is one of the ways that we're able to measure the rotation rate of our galaxy up to extremely high radii. So what we do is we use radio telescopes. And this is actually the type of thing that undergrads can do or any amateur who builds their own at-home radio dish. And you can get kits to do that. This is an experiment you can do, is identify where the clouds of cold gas are out in the outer wings of the arms of the Milky Way, take a look at them, and measure the Doppler shifting of that 21 centimeter line. And from the Doppler shifting, you can get the, the rate at which the um, cloud is moving forward and backward in that direction in the sky. And you can use geometry then to start to get at the orbital velocity of this gas. and uh, 
at the end of the day, this gives you the rot this gives you the the rotation curve for a galaxy that shows that um, everything is moving at about the same velocity as you move out towards the outer parts of the galaxy, and thus you can demonstrate for yourself there is something gravitationally changing. Um, well, I think that should be this everybody's homework matter. for this week then. <laughs> so everyone should go out and observe the 21 centimeter line and calculate the Doppler shift and use geometry to determine the uh, motion, the rotational motion of uh, our position within the Milky Way. Yeah, uh, completely elementary. Completely elementary. Everyone <laughs> get on that. So, uh, <coughs> so, but what are these cold? I mean, okay. So we can use these these cold clouds of gas as waypoints, as places to determine position. But, yeah. I mean, aren't these future nurseries of stars? Not necessarily. And the, the thing is that in order to get a star-forming region, you have to have um, dense gas that, that has sufficient mass that when you collapse it down and things start forming, uh, you get enough mass left over to form a star. And some clouds of gas just aren't massive enough that they're, they're ever going to form anything meaningful. And in other cases, the clouds of gas, as they are right now, are, are so diffuse and so stable that um, we, we don't see star formation in their immediate future. Now, spiral arms do help trigger star formation because, because what ends up happening is as these clouds of material orbit around the Milky Way, they get pulled in on the one side to, to the spiral arm. And then as they try and orbit out the other side of the spiral arm, they get slowed down. And as they linger in, in the spiral arm, uh, there's a good chance that there's going to be collisions, there's going to be compressions, there's going to be shock waves from supernovae. And all of these effects may cause some of these otherwise far too diffuse clouds of gas to have star formation. But in general, our galaxy is only about 1% effective at transforming gas into stars. So astronomers don't see, like, don't really do a lot of searching for great big clouds of future nurseries. It's more like waiting until the, you know, I guess it moves into that hydrogen alpha phase where you're actually starting to see the light coming off of the nebula, that you start to identify these, these star-forming regions? Well, there, there's lots of things that we do look at, and we're like, that, that is forming stars right now. And this is where people who work in the radio and the millimeter, um, they actually start mapping out some of these clouds. So there's certain what are called Bach globules. These are extremely dense, uh, often molecular hydrogen regions. So this is the other form of H2 that when you're doing an audio show, it makes no sense. So you have H Roman numeral 2, which is ionized hydrogen, and you have H subscript 2, which is molecular hydrogen. And when you look at these dense black regions on the sky, uh, Horsehead Nebula isn't a Bach globule, but it's an example of one of these dense black regions on the sky. Um, when you look at these dense black regions in the sky in the optical, they, they just look like the never-ending story, great nothing ate a part of the universe. But when you start to look at them instead in millimeter wavelengths, you start to see there are knots of thermally radiating areas. These are areas where the gas has begun to contract, and as the gas squishes down, the, the atoms start hitting each other. And, and this process radiates away um, basically warmth. So this is infrared, this is millimeter light. Um, you can sort of think of this as if you rub your hands together, it's going to generate heat. And if you had an infrared camera, you could actually hold your hands up and see that change in temperature from rubbing your hands. Now, when the gas starts colliding like that, you, you start initially giving off in the radio light. Now you wait as it continues to collapse, stars start to form, starts to light up in the infrared, and eventually it brings itself all the way into the bright blue UV when you get the youngest stars actually igniting. But, uh, so we look for those dark molecular clouds that are high density. And those, yeah, they do, they do probe those for star formation, but not every blob of gas is necessarily going to form stars. Can we look for places where, like, hydrogen is absorbing light? Like, I know, mm -hmm. you know, we look for places where, where certain elements are actually blocking, right? Right, and, and so when we look at nebula, we, we talk about there being reflection uh, nebula, we talk about there being um, emission nebula, and, and the truth is it's, it's just a matter of geometry. So if it's star 
cloud observer, that cloud is going to absorb out the, hydro the, the hydrogen lines. If it's a cloud in front of us, star off to the side, then we see emission lines. Um, and, and so there's, there's lots of different ways, and it's all about geometry that controls what we're able to see. And I think as we've been really experiencing with our with doing these live star parties, and we have one one person, we have Gary, who um, has got this just phenomenal it's telescope, amazing. fourteen inch telescope, but but he's in a really light polluted area, yeah. and you know he's in Los Angeles, and yet he mm -hmm. seems to be able to pulling together these really sensitive images of of nebulae. So so why? Does this hydrogen look so crisp and clear, even when you've got really bad light polluted skies? So, so he's he's cheating in a way. Um, if if you've ever had one of those kids' toys or cereal boxes where you get the little red filter and you look at this scrambled mess on the side of the cereal box, and then when you put the red filter in front of it, you suddenly see a message. Well, what's happening is, in that case, you have all of this visual noise, and that visual noise gets removed when you put the, the red filter in front of it. And Gary's doing the exact same thing. In his case, he's in the Los Angeles Basin, and there's, for the most part, sodium lights. Those are the yellow parking lot lights that make the sky glow this raspberry color on a cloudy night. And then there's also... Uh, now we're getting more and more fluorescent lights, which are giving off their blue UV light. And all of this is scattering skywards. Sometimes it's because people are using stupid light fixtures that point the light upwards, or they're illuminating buildings and it points the light upwards. Those um, people. Right. And, and sometimes it's just a matter that you're shining light down on cement, and the cement reflects the light back up. However the light's getting upwards, it's primarily consisting of the, the, the sodium light from the sodium light fixtures and um, a, a white light that's peeking off in the UV um, from the fluorescence or peeking off towards the UV, not actually in the, in the UV. And what he's doing is he's saying, okay, I'm going to look at the sky and I know that most of the sky is being brightly lit up by the atmosphere reflecting the sodium and all of this white stuff that, that is peeking towards the blue. I'm going to try and get rid of as much of that as possible, and I'm going to focus in on one line of light, the hydrogen alpha light, that's in the red as opposed to the, the blue and the sodium's yellow. And by focusing on just that one color, well, suddenly his background goes to black again because these street lights aren't giving off hardly anything at all in H alpha. So, so suddenly the light pollution for the most part has been filtered out the same way all that visual noise was filtered out with the red filter on the cereal box. And what's left behind is only the hydrogen alpha light. Now, now the crazy thing is, is if he actually went to a dark site, he'd get even more amazing images if he was able to use broader band filters that let more light in all at once. But he does what he can, and he's found a way to do really good astrophotography in a very light polluted part of North America. Yeah, so there's hope for all of us. Yeah, yeah, there is. Cool. All right, well, I think that wraps up for this week, Pamela. So thanks a lot, and we'll talk to you next week. That sounds great. Talk to you later, Fraser. And this is the part where we save. And I'm going to do a save as, so I can figure out what the heck this file is later. It's going to be 255 hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. And I will mix it down to a file. And, and now is when I'm going to start looking at all of your questions that are coming in. Um, all right. <clears throat> Just give me 11 seconds of processing time. <laughs> no problem. Um, cool. All right. So do you want me to... So now's the point where if you guys want to jump in and join us and join the Hangout and chat with us about space and astronomy, um, we're glad to have you. Uh, so I will post a link from the Hangout into the thread. You'll see this on the Google Plus thread where, um, where this show is being 
embedded. So um, it's the one that currently has 45 pluses and 10 shares and 44 comments at the time that I'm saying this. So if you want to join us and, and ask us some questions about, about what we talked about today or just anything in space and astronomy, as always, you get to test out Pamela's gigantic brain. Uh, we'll be glad to have you, but just make sure that you've got your uh, some kind of like headset microphone or you know, and you want to have your audio muted when you come into the hangout. Otherwise, it's Echo City, and we are trying to play whack a mole to get rid of it. Yeah. Um, so if you can just sort of uh, remember that, and then we'll also go through the questions that are on the comment thread where the video is being embedded, and we'll dig up some questions. So. Um, and when you see me looking all over the place, it's because I'm reading your questions. Yeah. Um, and then also we will uh, grab questions from people who are uh, posting to Twitter. So if you've got that pound CQX, pound uh, hangout. Hangout, hangout, we will uh, we will grab those as well. And then we will try and blend it all together into a question show. So why don't we grab a couple of questions. Uh, Austin Go asked, uh, are there hydrogen alpha filters for scopes that attach to the tube aperture? So, I mean, can you put a hydrogen alpha filter and over the telescope tube as well? That would just cost way too much money. So, so the, the problem is creating filters. You, you need really precise uh, mixed glass. Um, there's, there's different ways you can get at hydrogen alpha. Uh, one of the, the common ways to do it is to put a special coating on both sides that causes interference to happen between the two coatings and it's only thus transmitting the hydrogen alpha through. Um, right. This is a very delicate process. It's very, very easy to destroy one of these filters and the costs just go up vastly as they get bigger and bigger. A two inch by two inch filter, you're already looking at probably a couple of hundred bucks. Right, so the best way is is to just get Filter it over the top output. of the right, get it over top of the eyepiece and right yeah. in front of your camera, and not necessarily the the, the whole lens. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, cool. Hi, Bart. Um, let's see if we get any more questions. Um, there was a, there was another so one there. There was question a question on one. fusion. So, so Dennis Rodler is asking, um, what, so he says, what makes iron that special element that fusion happens to get an endothermic um, from iron on? So, so what happens is, is with stars, uh, you can take two hydrogens, smash them together, it releases energy. Uh, helium, it's a little bit trickier, cross-sections are evil, but eventually you get to the point that you, you have carbon burning, you have oxygen burning, there's beryllium involved in various steps. Uh, you can then get silicons coming coming together and you can build your way up through the periodic table and in all of these cases you're building a heavier element and in the process you're releasing energy up until you get to iron. Once you get to iron, in order to grow iron you have to actually add energy to the system. Um, so you can build heavier elements in this case by taking iron and just pummeling it with neutrons. And as you add neutrons, eventually the system will decay into having more protons in the center and it'll be a heavier element, but you're sucking energy out of the system. And, and this has to do with, with what you learn in third semester um, quantum mechanics, basically. And it's just what are the binding energies of the nucleus at this point. So um, the binding energies just have a flip point where as you get bigger, the binding energy it's, whoa, you're echoing. Um, as, as you end up with, with bigger and bigger cores, it just gets to the point that you have to throw energy into the system to add two things together. Right, and I think that was the question is like, why, like I know that, I know Dennis actually asked this question a little earlier to me and, you know, I sort of gave the same, the same answer that it's sort of like that's the nature of the reaction that you have to be, you know, it's, it gives off more energy than you put in all the way up to, to, yeah. to iron and then from beyond that point. But I think as you're saying that it is just, you know, you kind of have to do the quantum mechanics Math. It, it comes down to the binding energies of the atom. So the, the energy that it takes to hold the helium core together is, is such that the energy needed to bring the two hydrogens that close together 
that takes more energy than the energy of the helium just kind of floating around being happy. And so once the helium is formed, light has to go somewhere. Now iron, it does not want to well, iron's fine, but once you get heavier than iron, so for instance, gold or silver, the energy necessary to hold that nuclei together is, is greater than the binding energies of the things that you want to put together. So if, if you stick a couple of, of iron cores next to each other and smush and you don't add energy to the system, you're never going to get to the energy needed to bind those nuclei together. Right. They're not sticky, you have to add glue. That's the way to think of it. The energy is the glue that holds things together, and everything below that is sticky. Um, Martin Brochu asks, uh, can we reproduce the energy level that we see here on Earth? And so I think what he's, what he's getting at is, is you know, it, when hydrogen is giving off this very specific energy level as you're getting these, these jumps of the electrons up and down, yeah. can we produce that here on, on Earth? Yeah, with hydrogen we're good, and in fact you can do it in a chemistry lab, or like I said before, just go find the neon sign on your local deli. And so if you had like a big bag of hydrogen, how would you, would you burn it? Would you No, 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 it, it's way simpler than that. You, on it? You, you put it in a glass tube and you run electricity through the sucker and it's happy to do its thing. Oh, okay. I, hydrogen, hydrogen doesn't require that much. That, that's part of why we see it everywhere is... is it just shoot electricity through it. It glows. It's good. And it really would glow, like if you had a. That's a what an open sign is. Literally. Well, the but I thought it was a neon. Sign. They call it a neon sign, right? Well, that's because I think the green ones are filled with neon. No, the green ones are oxygen. I don't remember which color the neon ones are, but right. they're each filled with different gases, and the different gases. Right. Neon okay. is generic. It's like Kleenex, and. But and that process. Yeah. Is yeah. this ionization of light? Thanks to electricity, yeah, exactly. Giving off these these photons from this very specific electron jump. Okay. Now, if you're feeling really deadly, you you can take a tank of hydrogen and release the valve and let it on fire, and I, I think that's called an explosive reaction. But but you'll see the red from from the hydrogen as it as it all lights on fire and explodes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, I don't recommend that one. Um. It's a lot of fun, though. <laughs> it would be fun. <laughs> so did anyone, uh, did, uh, did Danny or Bart, did you have a question for us? Um, well, for these, the um, spectra you were talking about? Yes, exactly. You have a whole okay. bunch of different atoms there. <laughs> yeah, it's a uh, secondary school book uh, I've purchased because I like it so much. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> That, that's really cool. Yeah, diff different atoms. And, and what's cool is, is in a good physics lab, we'll actually have a, a bunch of uh, glass tubes that are usually labeled in masking tape that falls off with what's inside the glass tube. And you put them into a fluorescent light fixture, turn them on, and then you use the, the novelty rainbow glasses, and you can see the full spectrum. And you can see what's missing, or you can see what's... Yeah. Right, what's it's always perfect. what's... Yeah, it, it's just this set of discrete lines. Let me see if I... No, I don't have the right software to screen share on this computer. Um, uh, Dan, yeah, do you have a question for us? I think I, I muted you, so if you're... Because you were getting a big echo. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, oh, um, somebody mentioned as well that those, those hydrogen filters are very expensive. Yeah. Yeah, like how much would would a would a hydrogen alpha filter cost for just like an eyepiece? A couple hundred dollars. Let me let me look. Last I looked, yeah, I haven't looked in a while, and I know filter prices have come down because we're getting better at the manufacturing process. Um, but yeah. And you can also get them to clip right onto your DSLR as well. But again, you you know that's you know again yeah. very expensive if you want to put it right over the the aperture of the of the camera, right? So a 1.25 inch, so this is a standard eyepiece H-alpha filter from Astrodon, which is a company that, that is completely reputable. Uh, you're looking at $395. These, these, these are expensive. Um, in, if you're not in a light polluted area, don't bother. Um, just get yourself a nice red filter, a nice green filter, a nice blue filter if you just want to do astrophotography and if you want to do basic science. 
um, get yourself either the filter set corresponding to the Sloan Digital Sky Survey filters or the Johnson filters. Um, you always want to use filters when you're doing science so you can compare your results to other people. Oh, yeah. You, <laughs> you could buy a whole telescope. For that. I was not prepared for that kind of a price. Yeah, you could buy a whole I telescope for that price. I told you a $100. Yeah. Ouch. Okay. <laughs> And that's for 1.25 inches in, in, in diameter. You can see why I said don't bother getting it for the aperture of your telescope. Um, and all right. May I ask a question? Of course. Uh -huh. OK, well, um, you showed a, a time lapse of those telescopes with big lasers coming out of them for yes. the adap adapt uh, adaptive or optics. Yeah, optics, yeah. yeah. And, um, my question is, how does that work? Okay, so with, with adaptive optics, we, when we look at the sky, and if you joined us on our star party last night, you saw this very clearly, um, the, the atmosphere is constantly jibbling around, and as light tries to come down through that turbulent atmosphere, the, the light ray ends up getting jiggled around in the process. So when we look at a star, when we look at Jupiter, we see this ring that is constantly mutating in different ways and dancing around side to side while it's mutating in different ways. And we don't know how to correct for it quickly and easily when we're doing long exposures. So what they do with the laser is they use a special color that causes um, the gas high up in the atmosphere to, to ionize. And so we'll get this glowing spot on the sky that we know is above where all the noise is. And so when we know that glowing spot should be a perfect circle, we image it, measure how it's not a perfect circle, and then literally flex the mirror of the telescope like a funhouse mirror to compensate for what the atmosphere is doing. So if you can imagine um, taking two funhouse mirrors and putting them face to face so that when you stand in front of one, it distorts your image. Um, so it would actually need to be offset from one another. So you're over here, your light goes into this funhouse mirror, but someone looking at this funhouse mirror would see you looking perfect. So you have to have this, the atmosphere distorts it, the telescope redistorts it and thus corrects it. Right, there's and actually pistons, right? There's pistons underneath yeah, the telescope mirror. This is what people don't realize. And the, and the pistons are pushing up into the mirror and you can imagine, right, here's the mirror surface and then the piston pushes it up and distorts yeah. it and can pull it up and down and so the whole mirror surface can be distorted, can be pushed up and down as necessary to be able to, to mirror the distortions that the telescope is seeing up in the night sky, which is just, and, and they wouldn't know how to do that unless they created this fake star which they then watch how that star gets distorted and then they reverse the distortion. Just amazing. And, and they don't use the fake star all the time. The, the problem is you need something bright that you can do high speed imaging on because the sky is constantly changing. So if you happen to have a field that has bright star in the field, they, they use the actual existing star, less energy ex expended that way. Um, but most of the sky, you don't have a bright star in your field of view. So they, they're creating an artificial star with the laser and high-speed imaging, so you use one camera to do high-speed spe imaging on either the laser or the bright star, and then you do a long exposure with the main telescope of the field you're interested in, and all through the exposure, the mirror is constantly getting pressed on in different places, constantly reshaping the mirror throughout the entire exposure, allowing you to get these amazing crystal clear images. And people always, always think that that laser is somehow clearing out the atmosphere no. or something, right? But that would be a much more powerful laser would need, be needed to do that. Yeah, I, I had someone the other day when I was complaining about clouds go, but haven't we solved that yet? And I said, yes, we have. It's called space telescopes. <laughs> um, but if you're on the surface of the planet, we've got no solution for you. Yeah. Um, Sounds quite uh, expensive. <laughs> yeah. It, it is. This is why multinational observatories use the combined resources of a whole variety of different companies. So, um, and Roy uh, Salisbury, who's one of the astronomers in our, our live hangouts, uh, has mentioned, so he says a, a 12 nanometer filter costs about 550, yeah. but an even tighter filter, a 7.5 nanometer filter, is about 800 bucks. So, 
Again, that's the price of a telescope. Yeah, and and someone's pointing out Bader Planetarium also makes a um, narrowband filter. It's a different type of filter, so they're able to lower their costs. This is perfectly good for photography. Um, if you're doing science, I'd buy the Astrodon filters. If you're doing pretty pictures, uh, the Bader filters, I, I use them when I, for my solar filters all the time. They're, they're just a different way of manufacturing filters. It's lower cost. Well, I think we're running out of questions, so I think we can probably look to, look to wrap this up. But I just wanted to give people one last reminder of something that's going to be pretty interesting this weekend. Uh, tomorrow night, you're going to see a conjunction of the moon, a sort of a nice crescent moon with Venus. Yeah. And it's quite beautiful, very easy to see. Just look to the west after the sun goes down, anywhere on Earth, wherever you are, look to the west. As long as you have a, you know, it's going to be pretty even high in the sky, you know, probably 20... 20, 30 degrees above the horizon will be no problem. So, um, you'll and be able to see. And this is a good excuse to experiment with your camera. And I challenge you, yeah. Fraser, you need to try your camera because I'm going to try I'll mine. Take a, we'll take some pictures of it. it. Sure. We'll take some pictures of it. Um, you've got a much better zoom than I do. So, uh, but maybe I'll like, take it's a picture. It's not right. all about I'll take a picture through the eyepiece. That's what I'll do. <laughs> um, but, uh, of my telescope. But yeah, so you're going to see a conjunction of Venus and the Moon, and that's going to be Saturday night. And then on Sunday night, you're going to see a conjunction of Jupiter and the moon because Venus and Jupiter are actually quite close in the sky. So one night, you get the moon and Venus, and then the next night, you get the moon and Jupiter with a sort of a thicker crescent moon. And yeah. in both cases, off to the west, yes, you can see it in Hong Kong. Yes, you can see it in Australia. Yes, you can see it in South America, North America, Hawaii, anywhere on Earth, um, you'll be able to see this even from the space station. So, so it's the same thing. Everyone sees it the same Actually, thing. no, not from the space station. He would? Roughly? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Cause yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah, it's only 300 miles up. Yeah. So, so anyway, so if you want something to see, you know, and if you want to, like, organize something with your friends and your family or whatever, you know, you could see it in the most light-polluted skies, and it just looks beautiful, right? The, bright, the two brightest stars that you're going to see in the sky, one night right beside the moon. The next night, the other one's going to be beside the moon. It looks really nice. So I highly recommend it. Um, and apart from that, I think, we're, uh, I think we can wrap this up. Stick yep. another episode in the can. So, so thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. Uh, thanks, Pamela, for answering our questions. Sorry for the impromptu nature of this, but we've got, Pamela's got a big trip that she's got to be going on, and so we're not going to be able to record for a couple of weeks. And so this is, we try to get ahead. As and and being eternally behind. All, all because I'm traveling doesn't mean there's nothing going on. Next Wednesday, Emily Lactwall is going to be hosting our weekly science hour. Um, on Thursday, is going to be the virtual star party and the weekly sci and the weekly space hangout in the morning. And you can find out about all the things that we're doing and things that other people are doing that might interest you as well by following the CosmoQuest.org blog at CosmoQuest.org/blog. And uh, we'll do the best we can to keep you up to date on how to consume astronomy. All right. Well, thanks, Pamela. And we'll see you. I don't know when we'll see you now. Uh, I'll be around next Thursday night. Okay. All right. We'll see you then. Okay. I'll see Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.